my biggest nightmare. The biggest blunder I've done in business. And my definite biggest blunder. Good people, how are you? Tobela, Yeah, so now I'm here to talk about this, right? Can anyone tell me what this is? Water. Uh, it's actually two bottles of 500 mils of water. <laughs> that makes one liter. <laughs> but did you guys also know that it can take two liters of fresh water to make one liter of bottled water? It can take two liters of fresh water to make one liter of bottled water. Okay, why would it take two liters to make one liter that I'm gonna drink? Let's make it interesting. I'm wearing a cotton t-shirt, it's branded Noceta, uh, and that can take up to 2,700 liters of water to make. Let's make it even more interesting. So, how many of us here have had a beef burger before? <laughs> All right, that can take up to 3,500 liters of water to make. And these examples are a few of many examples of what we call a water footprint. Now what a water footprint is, it's a measure of how many liters of water it takes to make a specific item that can start its life on a farm, right? And that's pretty much what I'm going to talk about um, for some part of my talk before I get to the blunders. And um, why is a water footprint important? So let's go back to the bottled water example. So I said it takes two liters of fresh water to make one liter of bottled water. How's that possible? Well, there's the one liter inside the one bottle, and then there's the other liter that it takes to process packaging the water in that bottle. With the cotton t-shirt, you have to grow the cotton. After growing it, you have to make it into a thread, after making it a thread, you have to weave it into a fabric. After weaving it into a fabric, there's dyeing, there's... You can take it as far as putting it in the truck, how many, water, how many liters of water the truck uses to go to the store, where it delivers it. And if the person packing the clothes on the shelf had to drink some water before they could do their job. But that's not necessary. <laughs> right, so where did the passion with all of this begin? Um, when I was a kid, uh, you know, your parents would come home from work and they're tired. Hey, put water on that lawn. Go let's take a see. So my kelloan must know for my lawn is clean, right? And it's sam. But now the interests are clashing. You have exams you have to prepare for. You're a kid. Uh, your parents are came back from home. They're putting water there, but now they're tired. They send you to do it. You forget. Maybe you played soccer too late with your friends, or you had to finish your homework. Doesn't matter. But in the morning. Polish city, now I'm gonna walk into that mud hole that I made myself was because someone forgot to put off the tap. So because of those kinds of things, um, I became interested in what we call uh, water audit. So we would get in the morning to school to read flow meters. You know, when uh, there that by the tap in the school, it's usually far, and then there's a water meter there. And that flow meter's got like numbers that it takes. So as water flows through the pipe, you can measure how much water goes through the pipes um, that is used in, this, in the school. So we do that in the morning uh, before assembly, and we'd also do that in the afternoon before the groundskeeper left for uh, home. And then in high school, I entered several competitions. South African Youth Water Prize was one of them, which led me to go to Stockholm Junior Water Prize, which we won, and uh, got a scholarship, and then I went to go study. Uh, I studied in UKZN first in Durban, but I became a groovist, and that didn't turn out well. <laughs> so blunder number one, but I'll get deeper into it. Um, 
And then I went back to study in Bloemfontein, which is where I completed my civil engineering diploma. And then I also went to work, after which I then decided, nope, I'm gonna work for myself. And then having, work, having been building this idea, um, I then followed it up to say, okay, let me work on it full time. And that process um, led me to enter more competitions. And after entering more competitions, I eventually um, uh, became uh, aware of the fact that out of all of the water on the planet Earth, now if you imagine yourself to be so big that you're standing and you're looking at the planet Earth as a ball of ink. Oh, here's an example. So if you take out all the continents and you remove the water, and you put it into a ball, that ball is about its diameter, the size of Madagascar. It's that small. That's all the water on the planet. And if you want to imagine it in another way, if you could fill up a cup with, that's 250 mils with water, and that's all the water on the planet, then that which we have that is fresh can only fill up a teaspoon. So from this teaspoon, there's big competitors here. There's commercial agriculture, which makes the burgers and the t-shirts. Um, well, the products that make the burgers and the t-shirts. <laughs> um, and there's environment, the birds, the fish, they all need it. And then there's industry. We have electricity, we have roads, we have what? They use water. And then there's us. We have to drink water, we have to bathe in it, we have to wash our laundry, and everything gets connected like that. And this then made me take up the responsibility of saying, you know what? As this idea was inspired by the competition that um, I won in high school, um, let's rather build it. And that process um, has been very amazing, especially with the types of planning. So I'm gonna start with my journey in high school. So I didn't do my high school in Sesheho, even though I did attend primary school here at some point. And one of the naughty things that I did was to share trade secrets on how to make an experiment that can make it smell like rotten eggs. And I shared it with the naughty kids, and they went and disrupted school. So that was my first mistake. <laughs> and then the next thing, um, when I finished high school, I then went to study. So as I told you, I became a serial grievist. But not only that, I didn't take my studies seriously. So then you get to a point where you finish school, and then everyone is you know, getting their job and getting their work. And you're like, hey, next, right? So then you take yourself serious, and then you study somewhere else. That's what I did. And then after doing that, um, I ended up um, <coughs> um, working, um, doing my diploma in, at Central University of Technology, which when I finished it, I then became a lecturer's assistant. That's where I did more blunders. So as a lecturer's assistant, I had also started working on Roseta. So now I'm uh, an academician, and now I'm an entrepreneur who's innovator and I think I was volunteering in two student organizations. There was debate, and then there was South African Institution of Civil Engineering student chapter. I think I worked at a bar sometime there. So there was a whole lot of things. And everything backfired, and I lost the job in the next year. I lost the scholarship to complete my postgrad, and I only had this to work on. So I had to work really hard. And in that year, that's the year I think I had a similar story to Mpo. There's a crummy prototype that I put on my Instagram. Um, it's got just LEDs, three different colored LEDs. I don't know if you know what an LED is. So you know the light on your, the camera, a flashlight? That's an example of an LED. So it had three of those. I think it was red, yellow, and green, and a couple of other electronics. And I went with it to a funding instrument. I think they're called business partners. And I just rocked up there, having walked like a couple of kilometers, sweaty in a red golf shirt, and I rock up there with a science experiment, and I'm like, oh, please get me a cup of water. Instead of drinking it, I start putting probes in it. And this lady's just looking at me like, ah, this guy. <laughs> and then she's like, okay, where's your business plan? I'm like, okay, I have it. But now my spreadsheets there, they don't look right. And then she's like, mm. She goes behind, she takes about 10 minutes or so. She comes back, and then she's like, hey, your business model doesn't work, doesn't add up, so we're not gonna give you funding. So I had to let it go. But those are some of the things that I picked up on the way. And then um, after that, I went to then study in, um, no, not, not study. I went to uh, travel to Israel and Zambia. 
And then after traveling to Israel and Zambia, when I came back, one of the things that I realized was there's a lot of work that I need to do. In any case, when I came back, um, one of the first things that I noticed was I could enter competitions and raise money. And after raising that money, I then had something to experiment with. And as I'm experimenting, I realized I can't build that crummy prototype because it doesn't look nice. And if it doesn't look nice, I can't sell it. But I also need to make the cost cheaper. How do I get all of that? So I outsource that skill. After outsourcing that skill, here's what happens. You come to a company and they tell you, here's our wage bill. It's 40K, 50K a week to pay my staff, and that's the amount of money that you need to, subs to subsidize every, other, every week until you finish your product. So if your product takes six months to make, that's a lot of money you're going to have to lose. So I took a gamble and I was like, Ish, if I can use maybe three, four months to make this happen with a company that's big, maybe I can get some way. So after taking that risk, it didn't work out because three, four, five, six months into the funding that I had, that money was finished. And I had a prototype that had, I think one of the lights that could pick up if there's light or not, had this kind of cap, cap on it. And I outsourced this to professionals. And what took me aback was the fact that I trusted them with this kind of money and I still didn't get the kind of value that I got out of it. And that taught me to look for another way to do this. Uh, and I was like, okay, let me look for a different team. So I had a girl on my team who was a co-founder, and then I had a program, uh, an agriculturalist, and then I had a programmer, and then I also had a, uh, what's this, uh, a marketer. And the marketing went well because that period happened around the time of uh, COVID. And during that time, um, we were able to put word out. So we entered programs like MLab and others that could get us to spread our message across the rest of the world. And in the process of doing that, you learn so many other things. You know, like you can pay someone, people can say anything just so you can hire them. <laughs> and what they would say is, oh no, I can do this, I can do that, I can do this, I can do that. And then you end up paying that person to get your services done. And as soon as a certain time comes, there's excuse one, two, three, four, five. And then you're like, okay, I didn't know that this can happen. And as you're learning all of that, you're like, wow. One of the things that I need to learn from is how to be more assertive with my use of finances. And those are the things that become very, very, very much important as you grow your business, as it goes uh, bigger and you're trying to get it to reach more people. But in the process of doing that, one of the things that outsourcing and also having skills in-house taught me was to say, you know what, maybe bootstrap this and that's where this process is now. So there's four versions and I'm building the fifth one myself. And one of the things that I'm looking forward to is making more blunders with people that I've actually managed to impress with the promise of this idea as a value add. And so that I can you know, learn from that and actually deliver the solution. And I pretty much realized that there's a couple of things that are always um, standing out in my talk. One of them that's important is that um, there's a very great need as an individual who's starting a business, doesn't matter what kind of business, to have trust in yourself. Um, if you know what it is that you are able to do, believe that you can do it and do it with all your heart. Um, that's the one place that you always need to say, this is the last place I listen to before I can make my decision. That's what I've come to learn from all my blunders. And um, other thing, um, don't listen too much to what people can say about what they can do for you without them having to prove their mettle. Because that can really cost you a lot. It can be money, and if you can afford money, then it can cost you time. And that is a cost that not many people are willing to forfeit for anything. Um, so I'm pretty sure that I'm gonna make a few more mistakes before I get to where I can say I've made it. Hey, mom. Um, but I'm pretty much looking forward to the fact that there's gonna be quite a few more things to do. In any case, one of the things I'd like to leave you with is that um, in 2005, I won the Stockholm Junior Water Prize, and that was the, that's like the Nobel Prize for kids who are in water, right? And 10 years later, when I finished my diploma, um, one of the things that happens is the, the organization, the think tank that awarded me that award, um, came to ask me if I started working on it, and I just graduated. So why I'm thinking about this? My favorite quote is by uh, an author named Friedrich von Schiller, and it says, keep true to the dreams of thy youth. Um, one of the things that was actually uh, uh, the words of uh, congratulations from the organizers of the Stockholm Junior Water Prize 
was that if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? So I'm from that generation, and it uh, doesn't matter how many mistakes it'll take, but I'll keep playing that card. Thanks.